I, I wanted to review where we were so far a little bit. In particular where, where I think that you have, have gotten to. And, and also give you a hint as to what's next. So, so what we have done so far basically is talk about what you could call macroscopic energies. <laughs> energies of the word macroscopic is just the uh, opposite of microscopic. It's something that's large. In particular, it's macroscopic if it contains many, many atoms. That's one way of saying large. If something's large, then it's got a lot of particles in it. It's made up of a lot of particles. This bowling ball contains a lot of atoms. So it's a macroscopic object. So do I. So do a lot of things. How big does something have to be to be macroscopic? Well, it turns out even thousands of atoms, is all, hundreds and thousands of atoms are already almost big enough to be, to be considered in terms of statistics. So they're almost all big enough to be macroscopic. Uh, for the most part, we'll talk about things that you can see with your eye as being macroscopic. So those things are made up of, they're large objects made up of a lot of smaller things. And we talked about the energies of those kinds of large objects. And so for those things we've talked about internal energies. The energies that are somehow inside there, we're going to see that those are energies of all those particles. You already know some of that. Bond energy is a, is a macroscopic word that we've been using. This thing has some bond energy that can change. Kinetic energy, again, it's the energy of this whole thing moving. It's the energy of a macroscopic object that happens to be swinging. It happens to be moving. Gravitational potential energy is, is the energy of, of interaction between the, uh, an object, the Earth, and another object. In this case, the bowling ball, maybe. Spring potential energy, I think you've talked about a little bit in DL and we'll talk about it more today. <coughs> what we're coming to is we're, we're coming to the idea that not only can there be a macroscopic kinetic energy, this whole thing can be moving, but in fact you, something that you already know all the atoms inside here are also jiggling around a little bit. And so they are also moving. And so the, turns out the thermal energy, the thing that we call thermal energy, the macroscopic energy of all of the atoms, in, an internal energy of all the atoms inside here that depends on the temperature, is going to be just related to the, to the kinetic energy of the atoms inside. If we think of it as microscopic terms, the atoms inside are, any one atom is a microscopic thing. It isn't made up of a lot of atoms. It is just an atom. Um, and so its motion we'll call kinetic energy. There will also be, for, for most things, there will be uh, some atomic uh, interaction, some chemical bonding that we have to worry about. And the interaction energy, we'll always use potential energies as interaction energies. That interaction energy will use a potential energy to talk about the interaction between two particles, any two particles that we want to. Uh, kind of a generic picture of chemical bonding. We're not going to talk about ionic bonds uh, and uh, hydrogen bonds and, and covalent bonds and metallic bonds. We're not going to separate all that. We're just going to say, well, look, any two things attract each other if they get close enough and, and they're not oppositely charged. Any, any two atoms, normal atoms, will attract each other if you get them close enough together. Even inert gases, even argon. <laughs> two argon atoms, when you get them close enough together, it turns out they attract each other. You know this because there is such a thing as liquid argon. So there's obviously an argon-argon bond even when there's, it's really weak of course. So that microscopic picture we will probably start on next week, at least we'll get close to next week and we'll work on for the next few weeks. Where we are right now is a macroscopic picture, taking the big picture, looking at, 
uh, a big view of things that are changing around us. And you've talked about a lot of these energies. I'm not going to spend time listing the indicator that you need for all of these except for two of them. Gravitational potential energy depends, it's an interaction energy so it depends on how close the object is to the earth. This tennis ball as it gets closer to the earth, after I let go of it, it'll get closer to the earth. As it gets closer to the earth, its gravitational potential energy will go down and its kinetic energy is going to go up. By the way, the kinetic energy goes up a lot, but it doesn't bounce all the way back up here because somehow energy, mechanical energy, gravitational potential energy, started out with a lot of gravitational potential energy, ends up with less. Does it have kinetic energy now? Is that where the energy went? It's pretty, pretty boring. It's just sitting there. Uh, if it's just sitting there, it doesn't have any extra kinetic energy, so where did the energy go? By now, you should have the first inkling of where, of what energy goes up. When you start to see energy disappear from, apparently disappear, when mechanical energies go away, what energy is going up? Thermal energy is going up. If I had a really sensitive thermometer, I would find out that that uh, tennis ball got a little bit hotter. The temperature went up a little bit. And if you don't believe it, take a tennis ball and squeeze it about 30,000 times and then you'll notice that, all right, you don't need to do that many. Uh, take a rubber band and, and stretch it about 40 times and then stop and, and you'll notice that rubber band's hotter than it was. <coughs> so thermal energy kind of shows up when, when other energies are, it's called dissipation. Dissipation is when, um, when mechanical energies turn into thermal energies, get transferred into thermal energies. And it happens a lot and usually it's not the greatest thing. What you'd like is the tennis ball to bounce all the way back up here. Uh, it's not going to do that. So gravitational potential energy depends on the height of the object. Spring potential energy, I think you've talked about a little bit in discussion lab. It depends on it depends on the length, the, the changes in the length of the spring. This spring has a length. If its length changes, then the spring potential energy has changed. In DL, you talked about this object uh, hanging from a spring and noticed that when you started oscillating, if I pull it down, so it comes, I pull it down to here, and so it oscillates up and down below here and up above here, so this object will go up and down below, up above and below, down below the equilibrium point. When the object goes below the equilibrium point, when, not, in the object, when it's oscillating and the object is at the equilibrium point, it's moving fast, it has a high kinetic energy. When it goes down below the equilibrium point, it comes down here and stops before it comes back up again. When it comes up above the equilibrium point, it's headed up here, it stops, turns around, and heads back in the other direction. So they're exactly at the top for that uh, tiny, infinitesimal amount of time up there at the top, it isn't moving. Same thing at the bottom, the tiny infinitesimal amount of time at the bottom, it isn't moving and in, in the middle it's moving really fast and you can watch that. Equilibrium's right there. So it's moving fast through equilibrium. So the kinetic energy is high at the equilibrium point. Kinetic energy is low when you go down below it, it goes down. When you go up above it, the kinetic energy goes down. That tells you something about potential energy. If the kinetic energy is high at at the equilibrium point, then the potential energy is low. 
If the kinetic energy is high at the equilibrium point uh, and energy is conserved, then the potential energy must be low at the equilibrium point. If the kinetic energy is low up here, in fact it goes down to zero up here, then the potential energy must be high when, when you raise the thing up, <coughs> up above the equilibrium point. Same thing down below. Down below the equilibrium point, the kinetic energy goes back to zero again, which means the potential energy must have gone back up. Potential energy is high when you get away from the equilibrium point. When you stretch a spring at some distance, call it delta y, away from the equilibrium point, I'm not sure what I'm going to call it in the next slide, so I'll call it delta y right now, but maybe I'll call it delta x. I stretch it some distance away from the equilibrium point, the potential energy goes up. If I stretch it in the other direction away from the equilibrium point, still goes up. Potential energy goes up in both directions. Let's see what I called it. Here's the equations for these. You already know the change in thermal energy depends on the change in temperature. Change in bond energy depends on uh, latent heat. I, I say you already know that because I'm confident you do because there's a, a quiz coming up where those things might show up. So uh, I'm, I'm confident you know how to deal with them. Kinetic energy, we talked about last time, depends on the speed. In fact, depends on the speed squared. As I pointed out, we're, we're not going to let the mass of our physical system change. Only in relativity does the mass change. And, and even then, if you're careful to include energy, uh, energy changes, then, then the mass doesn't change. So, so the mass of our physical object is never going to change. So how does the kinetic energy change? Only if the speed changes. In fact, it's not changes in the speed. It's changes in the square of the speed that tell you how much the kinetic energy change because the kinetic energy depends on the square of the speed. So if you double the speed, then the kinetic energy has gone up by a factor of 4, 2 squared. Gravitational potential energy depends on the height of the object. Spring potential energy depends on how much you stretched the spring. Spring potential energy depends on how much you've stretched the spring away from equilibrium. <coughs> if you stretch it upward, if the spring right there gets shorter, so you might say, well, if I stretch it upward, I'm going to call that a positive motion of the mass. So I'm going to say x is positive there. Um, 1 half k x squared is the potential energy of the spring. Let's say I push it up by x equal to 2. Then I'll square that and I'll get 4. What if I pull it down? If I pull it down, I'd like to call x minus 2 if I pull it down by 2. But minus 2 squared is also 4. So also the potential energy goes up by the same amount. It goes up by the same amount whether I compress the spring or stretch the spring away from equilibrium. There's equilibrium right here. There it's stretched by about 10 centimeters. And there it's compressed by about 10 centimeters. And those are the same potential energies because they depend on the, the, the square of the, of the stretch, not the direction. It's like kinetic energy doesn't, kinetic energy depends on the square of the speed. I notice a tendency for people to look at that letter V, that letter V there and call it velocity. And unfortunately, in, in physics we have a, a slightly more technical meaning of velocity. You're, you're in your car, you have a speedometer that tells you how fast you're going. In fact, it tells you your speed. 
It doesn't tell you your direction. It doesn't tell you your velocity, it turns out. Velocity we use, uh, uh, velocity includes speed and direction. It turns out it has a, velocity is a directional quantity called a vector. And velo the direction doesn't matter for kinetic energy. If I throw this ball that way at so some speed and I throw the other one the other way at the same speed, they have the same kinetic energy and the direction made no difference at all. Or if I throw it downward at some speed, direction made no difference. The kinetic energy is the same however I throw that ball. If I throw it at the same speed, then I've given it the same kinetic energy. Yeah? Um, for the change in spring potential energy or um, kinetic energy, what is the delta of the the delta is the change in the thing that's next to it. So delta Ke, delta kinetic energy is one half, well I could write it this way, it's delta of one half mv squared, because one half mv squared is the kinetic energy. Now one half and m don't change, so when I take final minus initial, those are going to be in both terms. Well, let's, let's just write it all out. Let's just say that. Final squared minus 1 half m v initial squared. That's the difference between the two kinetic energies. Now you can see that there's a 1 half m in both of those. So this is v final squared minus v initial squared. And I have cheated you a little bit by calling that the change in v squared. You don't subtract the initial and final until after you squared them. You don't subtract initial and final speeds and then square the total. That's not, gonna get, that's not the right result. It's not going to give you this, in fact. So the difference in kinetic energies is final minus initial and that means s square the speeds before you subtract them, basically. 